Nice, nice to meet you, David. Daniel and Greg. Right. Oh, great. How long have you guys been doing a podcast? I think we started it in 2017. And oh. we, yeah, so we've, we've been doing it um, for a number of years. And we've interviewed how many professors from Stanford? Two? So far, uh, yeah, including John Crumboltz. He he was in the psychology department. Did you know him at all? He uh, he, he was a specialist in career counseling and uh, used some uh, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. No, I don't know him. I'm over in the medical center and I'm only kind of a half a faculty because I'm on the voluntary faculty. I'm on the slave labor, slave labor uh, faculty. And uh, I, I try to stay out of the line of fire. I sneak in and do my teaching and, and, and sneak home because I'm not sure I'm in the mainstream, really, in the Department of Psychiatry. What, <laughs> what, what department are you in, Greg? Well, I, I already graduated, and I got a, a bachelor's from Stanford in mathematics. Uh, oh, wow. That, you I'm, must I'm, uh, be a uh, brainy guy. <laughs> I would have uh, done that if I was I, smart enough, but I, <laughs> I, I did philosophy because I, I had roommates who did stuff like that. They were so much smarter. I said, I, oh, no, I, no hope. I just have a growth mindset. That's all. A master's electrical engineering and a PhD oh, wow. in developmental psychology within the School of Education. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Yeah. That's when you were doing math, did you ever do multi equation systems? Uh, like uh, a, a simultaneous equations for like, like for electrical circuits and stuff? Well, yeah. In uh, my master's, I did it in electrical engineering and, and we had signals and systems classes. So uh, I, Fourier, I, Fourier transform, Laplace. Yeah. Uh, did you ever come across structural equation modeling? Structural. I'm going to have to. <laughs> it's you. you well, I, it, it's a type of uh, modeling I do of a lot of my data, some of the papers I've published. Uh, you you model your data and and you have multiple equations, linear equations, and like regressions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but dependent variables in some equations can be independent variables in other equations, and so you have to solve it with uh, uh, maximum likelihood techniques, and then see if your model fits your data. It's it's really it's really fun. It's like kind of a applied mathematics. That's stuff that I can that I can do, but it's really, it's really fun. Yeah. Trying to, trying to uh, turn sort of the fuzziness of behavior into a science uh, and predict. Yeah, it. right. It uh, can, it, it can definitely be done if you get, uh, measure things accurately, emotions or whatever, you know, I'm trying to model changes in psychotherapy over time and find out how psychotherapy actually works. Interesting. Huh. So tell us more, like, well, I guess we're, are, are we getting started already? Or? Yeah, I guess yeah. we could actually get started. Um, sure. Just, just to give you like a little background, we've been doing yep. these a while. And if there's anything you say, uh, David, that you feel like you want to lead it, we've had several people on the podcast disclose some stuff and they felt really uncomfortable about it. So if there's anything like you're, you want us to delete, we'll delete it. We just post the audio also. So the video will be here. And then usually the interviews are about an hour. It's kind of a conversation. I would say, you know, we, we just kind of jump into a conversation around like your history. Uh, there's a reason why we reached out to you specifically. You, you definitely have enticed us like to just kind of pick your brain on, on, on psychiatry and, and, and psychology and that sort of thing. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'd um, love it. I, I don't really need anything to lead it. I, I stick my foot in my mouth sometimes, but uh, people have, I think, gotten gotten used to that. So. Yeah, and, and also your your research is, is so relevant now with 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 the pandemic and um, yeah. you know all these people dying four hundred thousand in the U.S. and uh, and then people just kind of closed in at home and like they're losing their social connections in some ways and so so they're dealing with like depression and and yeah. feeling like they're not good enough they lost their job um, they're they're sort of worthless um, yeah I was, right we we'd love to hear you know your take on kind of the the, the world's kind of current. Uh, oh, happy, happy to do that. Absolutely. So, how did yeah, you then, two guys uh, connect? I mean, I'm not supposed to be interviewing you. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. So, uh, I'm I'm working on a a website business that's uh, kind of a marketplace for Stanford students. Oh. And um and and Daniel's an entrepreneur, and I um I, I actually came to his office one day with one of my partners, and I asked him if he would want to hire some Stanford students uh, or alumni. And, and so that, that's what kind of started our friendship. And then, and then we've subsequently, you know, gone, gone on walks together on, um, up on, up on the, on the dish. Um, oh yeah. And, cool. Um, and hung out quite a bit. Um, before the COVID, I took my, my Stanford students on Sunday hikes for three or four hours and I would treat them along the way. 
Oh. And then we'd go down to the Cupertino Plaza for a dim sum feast. Oh, and yum. it was the highlight of the week. Oh, those are good memories. Yes. <laughs> There's all these trails around my house, so they just show up at my front door at nine, and then we we go off hiking. I miss those days. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they'll be back. So I'm going to start a vaccinated uh, hiking group here as soon as I get my second vaccination and see if we can get a little of the spirit flowing again. Just to kind of start things off, I'm curious, David, or should we call you Professor Burns? Or um, uh, Yeah, David's good. David. good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, how just... Uh, I'm I'm just kind of curious for my own sort of self-interest. Like, how have you personally been sort of emotionally dealing with the pandemic and uh, trying to sort of keep your spirits up? Um, I I, re- I remember. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start with that. Are we on now? Or yeah, yeah. I, I oh, we recording. are. Okay. Yep, well, sorry. I'm I'm a pretty happy happy person and and a firm believer, you know, that your thoughts and not what's happening creates the way you feel. But uh, I have downtimes just like everyone else, but it's, it's, it's always because of some specific thing that's, that's upsetting me, for example. But, but I, I would say 90% of the time, I'm just happy and, and really highly charged pretty much. I, I have a Feeling Good podcast every Monday and I have uh, treat, I treat a lot of people live because you know, I, I, I can usually complete treatment in a single session with people in two, a two hour session using the new techniques we've developed in my weekly training group at Stanford. And, uh, and then I publish a lot of them live so people can see this is really happening. They can hear the actual therapy sessions on the podcast. And I've treated about eight people with COVID related uh, depression or, or, or anxiety. So I, I, I can, I can speak to that, but the, the idea that you're both probably familiar with, you know, is, is that the events of our life don't, don't create our emotions. It, it's our thoughts about what's happening. And when you're depressed and anxious, those thoughts will generally be distorted and, and illogical. And the moment you change the way you think, you can, you can change the way you feel. And, and that, uh, you know, is true. That, I mean, that idea has been around for 2,000, 2,500 years, but it's, it's, it's a very practical way to change, change the way you think and feel. And even in a time of like pandemic, it's appropriate to be concerned. When I go out jogging, actually I call it slogging because people think I'm walking. I've gotten so old and slow, but I feel like I'm whizzing along. And then people say, oh, I saw you out walking and I want to kill them. <laughs> but but when I'm out walking, I'm very careful. If, if I, someone approaches me, I go to the other side of the street. And so you, you want to be careful and anxious enough to you know not be doing foolish things but if you're really depressed and anxious or guilty or ashamed or or angry that that's not likely to be due to the pandemic but to distorted thoughts you're having about things and and once you pinpoint what those are and change them uh, you can change the way you feel and that's a great message throughout all of history pandemic or, or not I, I I was fascinated by that story you were saying. Um, and, and I, I was I was watching some of your your, your lecture videos and uh, great, you, thank you. You had mentioned that that you had a patient that came to you and 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 she was depressed and you know she 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 felt like she nothing she had accomplished nothing of, of value in her life and 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 she wanted uh, wanted to commit suicide uh, and and so uh, you you had her uh, do an exercise of of think of things that she had actually accomplished in her life, um, sort of take that home. When she came back to you a week later, uh, she said, well, you know, actually I escaped Nazi Germany and um, uh, saved my children's lives. Uh, my husband died in the concentration camps and all my family members did. And, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, another is my son uh, just finished first in his class in Harvard Law School. By the way, I speak five languages. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and so like kind of remembering those accomplishments changed her, her sort of paradigm in it and it snapped her out of it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the reasons was because the thought that upset her, which is the same as a lot of people th- listening to this podcast, is I'm, I'm worthless because I've never accomplished anything in my life. That was the thought she had at the moment. She attempted suicide and then she was referred to me from the intensive care unit when, when she recovered. She was one of my first cognitive therapy uh, patients and it just blew my mind to see how quickly 
people could recover it was so moving because I had spent years as a psychiatric resident and my postdoctoral research studying this ridiculous chemical imbalance theory which is was debunked really 40 years ago depression isn't caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain but I was doing research on that I was giving out these so-called antidepressants by the you know buckets full and I rarely saw anyone recover and then when I heard this new drug-free treatment based on changing the way you think I thought it was nonsensical I, d I didn't believe it was possible but I, I tr decided to try it with some of my worst patients just to prove to myself that it it wouldn't work and then it, it did work and I changed the whole direction of my my career and decided not to spend you know a tenure track thing studying theories that were false and giving out medications that that didn't really do it for most people. I wanted to see people go from severe depression to joy and wake up and say, it's, it's great to be alive. That, that's what I get tremendous gratification from. Would you say that's the most powerful technique that you found this, this idea of like reflecting on your life, what actually have you accomplished and, 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 and almost sort of a list of, of what you're grateful for? Um, well, no, no, I would say I would never use a technique, technique like that. I, I don't throw, method at patients in that way. I don't have formulas for things you can do to, to, to feel better. I call those nonspecific treatments in debt instead. And there's actually two massive change technologies that, that I use now. The cognitive is, is just just one of them. That That's the one that my first book, Feeling Good, was all about. And what I do is I ask people, what are your negative thoughts? You see that your thoughts create your moods, not what's happening to you, not the circumstances of your life. And, and then those thoughts are, 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 are distorted. And, and so the reason that that inventory was so helpful to her was because she was telling herself something that was false. I've never accomplished anything meaningful in my life. And so the intervention was to get her to see that that was not true. And the moment she saw it, her depression instantly vanished. But I've created over a hundred techniques like that because different people have different kinds of thoughts, negative thoughts, and and so and everyone is is, is individual. So I never ever recommend meditation, exercise, healthy diet, any of those things that have no specific antidepressant uh, effects. They're good, you know. I'll, I'll jog today. I don't want to jog. I've never had a runner's high, but I do it, you know, out of a sense of discipline. But I use specific techniques that, that will quickly prove to a person, first of all, how distorted those messages are and also how cruel those messages are, the things that you do to yourself. You'd never talk to another person. And so that that's half of the picture. And, and that's been known now for really... 40 years when my book Feeling Good came out, there were only about 12 of us cognitive therapists in the world and everyone thought we were quacks. And the publisher published it, but they wouldn't support it because they said no one would ever want a book on depression. It has no commercial value. Turn out that people who read my first book, Feeling Good, two thirds of them recovered from severe depression within four weeks with no treatment. And that word got out and then doctors and psychologists started recommending to the to their patients and now it's sold over 5 million copies. But that's all about changing the, changing the way you think. And then with my group at Stanford, we have something new that's even more mind blowing that can lead to ultra rapid recovery for, for people. That, that's really fascinating to me because um, I, I had heard in the past of, of, a, of a technique of, of, of sort of saying, stop, uh, if you feel that negative, the negative self talks talk coming uh and then if you say stop then then you think of three things you're grateful for and then visualize something that you're grateful for and and then do some kinesthetic motion like uh you know smile to sort of feel better yeah um, but but what you're saying is to get really specific on what yeah. precisely are the negative thoughts yeah capture yeah. Those. yeah the people get confused because anything has a placebo effect even antidepressant drugs have a placebo effect. You take them, you get side effects, the doctor tells you you're gonna get better. And so 30 to 40% of people will recover from depression from a placebo effect. 
but the uh, and so uh, there's a lot of like formulas. People are looking for a simple way to treat people with this formula or or that formula. But if you want to have a, a a really powerful treatment, you have to know what what the person is thinking. And 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 to give you an example of that, in the early days of cognitive therapy, this guy came to me because he'd been depressed his entire life. He also coincidentally escaped from Nazi Germany. And as a teenager, he was shining shoes on, on the streets of, of Manhattan to survive. But he eventually became incredibly wealthy, became an industrialist, manufacturing plants in, in New York. But he told me he'd been, he felt worthless his entire life. And he'd been in treatment his entire life and no one had ever been able to help him. And those were the days when this erroneous theory that exercise causes endorphins to go up in the brain. That's just another quack theory that someone made up that has no research to support it. You can't measure endorphins in the human brain. It just it just sounds good. But it was big at the time. So I thought, well, I'll try it. I'll try it. I, I told him your whole problem uh, Ezekiel is is that you've got to uh, start exercising and get your brain endorphins off. That'll help your depression. And the poor guy, he was an elderly man, and I got him up to running 12 miles a day. And I asked him, Ezekiel, how did you feel at the start of those 12 miles? And he said, I felt like a totally worthless human being. And I said, and how did you feel at the end of the 12 miles? <clears throat> and he said, I felt like a totally exhausted worthless human being. It had no effect whatsoever. And finally, I, I remembered, you know, my cognitive therapy, but what, what are his thoughts? And I said, Ezekiel, tell me, why do you feel like a worthless human being? You escaped from Nazi Germany. You've been amazingly successful. You have a beautiful wife and home. You're incredibly wealthy. And then he got real sheepish. And, and he said, well, do I have to tell you, doctor? And I said, well, if you want me to help you, I've, I've got to know what your negative thoughts are. Why, why do you feel you're a worthless human being? And then tears started going down his cheeks. And he said, well, ever since I've been a little boy, I've had a fear of the dark and I have claustrophobia. And I'm so damn ashamed of that. I just feel that means I'm not a real man. And, and I've been in agony every day of my life since I was six or seven years old. And now we know do you see why why he's he's depressed? I, I could have had him run from New York to Los Angeles and it wouldn't have done him a damn bit of good because he would have just still believed I'm I, I'm worthless. And then once that came up, then I knew, you know, here's some techniques to help him. And I said, Well, here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel. I want you to set your when you go back, he commuted down from New York to see me. And I was in Philadelphia at the time. I said, set your alarm clock for two in the morning when it's totally dark and then go down in the basement of your house where it's totally dark and roll yourself up in a rug so you'll be trapped in the dark and have a tape recorder next to your head and just stay there until you're cured. And that's called exposure. And he left my office and called back and, and said he, uh, I was fired. And he said, that's terrible what you told me to do. It's so irresponsible. And then apparently he went to a psychiatrist in New York and to find out why Burns was such a quack. And the psychiatrist says, Burns is right. Go back to Burns. Do exactly what he told you to do. That is the cure, exposure. And so he came back and he agreed to do it. And, and then he came back a week later, he brought his tape recorder and he said he went down in his basement. He was terrified. His anxiety was on a zero to hundred was a hundred. And he, you could hear him talking. I told him to talk and every minute dictate into the tape recorder, how anxious he was and what his thoughts were. And he, and he had the thought that a fat ghost would come out of the dark and sit on his chest and suffocate him. And he said for 15 minutes, he was terrified, 100%, no improvement. And then he suddenly said out loud, I'm sick and tired of waiting for you. If you're going to sit on my chest, get it over with. And then he said, no ghost came out of the dark. And his anxiety went from 100 to zero, and he was cured instantly. And that was the end of for him, I guess, 65 years of, of, of suffering, his recovery took 15 minutes. But I had to know what his specific negative thoughts were and then have a powerful technique to, to antidote those thoughts. 
and uh, non-specific things, you know, exercise is good for your health and you may love meditation. I always work with specific techniques because I, I want to get really high speed, dramatic total recovery from from my patients. Uh, and, and I see patients now for two hours, two hour sessions, and 90% of the time when someone comes to me with, say, decades of severe depression, severe anxiety, failed therapy, they recover completely in one session. And then we do a brief relapse prevention training and then they're, they're on their way. But I can only do that by working with what specific things they're, they're telling themselves. What would you say, I guess, how, so you're saying expose them directly to the, 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 the fear and the anxiety itself. So like, that would be one of a hundred techniques I might use, by the way. That's that's not a cure in and okay. of itself. It's just a, a technique. And that's the one that happened to work for Ezekiel. I think one of the large uh, fears that a lot of people have, and you, everyone on this podcast, I don't think has this fear, but it's talking in front of large, I mean, everybody gets nervous talking in front of oh, people. Oh, yeah. But some people have like pure fear and anxiety. And oh, yeah. I had that. I had crippling public speaking anxiety. My first, it's my favorite thing to treat. You know, I couldn't have done this podcast years ago. I've had so many anxiety disorders myself. I wrote a book on anxiety disorders called When Panic Attacks. And when I wrote it, I realized, my gosh, I've had 11 anxiety disorders myself. And then after the book came out, I remembered six more that I'd forgotten about. But I've had horrible public speaking anxiety. I had camera phobia. I couldn't until several years ago, I couldn't smile. Here, watch. Ha. Hi, see, I can smile in front of a camera. I couldn't do that three years ago. And, but my first public speaking was at Oxford University in England. I was invited to present my research on brain chemistry to this thing called the NATO Advanced Study Institute for Metabolic Compartmentation in the Brain. I had to give this talk. They had the 80 top brain scientists at the wor in the world there, and they invited two younger people I was one of them who, was, who were doing, you know, re research that they thought might be interesting. And my research was challenging the chief of the National Institute of Mental Health from the Laboratory of Preclinical Psychopharmacology, because I, I read their research and to me it looked screwed up. And I redid the study using different methodology and, and came to the conclusion that they were wrong. But I had heard, and this is my first academic lecture, I had heard that the guy I was criticizing loved to humiliate people in conferences and that he would shout at people. And I knew he was going to be at this conference. And it was, mine was the last talk of the conference. And I had to wait four days with these Nobel Prize winning types of people doing this stuff that was absolutely amazing. And then finally, and I was just ang anxious the whole time I was in hell saying, I wish I wasn't here. And the night before I wandered around Oxford University, I couldn't sleep a wink. Owls were hooting at me in a disparaging way. And I fantasized that this guy would be right in front of me when I gave my talk and that at the end he'd stand up and start screaming at me. And when the time came, I was the last talk of the conference and I walked up to the podium and he was exactly as I'd fantasized him, right in the front row, right in front of me. And I was so nervous, I just trembled and read, mumbled my talk. I didn't give my talk. It was 10 minutes. And then at the end, there was this silence. And suddenly this guy jumped up in the air exactly as I had fantasized and started screaming it and telling me what bullshit my research was. It was just horrible. It was like my worst fantasy come to life. And then there was, he sat down and there was this deafening silence. And then the moderator says, does anyone else have any questions for the young doctor? <laughs> and there was nobody made a peep. And then, and then he said, okay, this ends our conference. We're all going to celebrate now at this restaurant two blocks from here. We'll walk down there and, you know, it'll be our, our partying thing. And walking down there, no one would walk next to me. And when we sat down, no one would sit next to me. And on the plane back to the United States, I was more humiliated than I've ever been in my entire life. It was horrible. But halfway across the ocean, I started thinking about what he said. I said, that guy is still full of shit. He does not know what he, he's talking about. He's just a bunch of hot air. And I went back to Pan 
and talk to my collaborators. I had this great guy who was working with Martin Prang, who was one of the top, some from, someone from NIMH told me he was um, one of the top two mathematicians in the United States, of, uh, applied mathematics. I mean, the guy was an absolute genius. Uh, he was the head of our computer facility. And I said, Martin, I, I think this guy's full of shit. He says, you're, you're right. So we did a few more si computer simulations to prove that what he was saying was wrong. And then I submitted this paper. It was the first paper I, I ever wrote. The editor of the journal called three weeks later and I thought, oh gosh, now I'm going to get rejected. Why can't they just send me a rejection letter? And, and he says, your article was unanimously accepted. And the odd thing, there's no suggestions for revision, but I want to know if we could submit it for the A.E. A. Bennett Award. You'll be competing with scientists all over the world. It's given once a year for the top paper on brain research, and NIMH will be submitting their work. I said, oh my God, that's fantastic. Go for it. And then he called three weeks later. He says, you're the unanimous winner of this year's A.E. Bennett Award. And can you go to New York and give a talk, give your talk in front of a thousand scientists in three weeks? And you said, you bet I will. <laughs> yeah. So I, every night when I went to bed, I, I, I fantasized it differently. And I imagined just talking my talk making friends with the audience, not having any notes, and just telling them what a gi what giants my collaborators were and how lucky I was to be involved in, in this. And I would fantasize them then rushing to the podium afterwards and being warm and friendly. And I didn't believe it, but I forced myself to think that way. And then when I gave up, got up there to give my talk, that was exactly exactly what happened. But I love treating people with public speaking anxiety. And that's just the technique that worked for me, you know, positive imaging. But for other people, there will be other, techni other, other techniques. Everyone is individual and you can't have formulas. You can't treat people too well with formulas. I, uh, I think one of the reasons why we actually had you on this, this, this uh, talk and, and, and interviewed you is that you have a famous quote uh, that one of my advisors would say for years, for years, they would say the quote, action precedes motivation. Yeah. And they would just tell me that over and over again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what does that mean to you? You're the, you're, that's your quote. Like, what does yeah. that actually mean? Yeah. Like, it's short. It's simple. It, it, yeah. It's so well, uh, sure. Thank you. That, that that's that's a good uh, that's a good one. Uh, when a lot of people with depression and many without, you know, have a problem with do nothingism or procrastination, and so they they're they're saying they want help with procrastination. I say, great, I'd be glad to help you with your procrastination. What kind of help are you looking for? And they said, well, well, I need help with motivation. I'm not motivated. And I say, sorry, we're, that's not on the, not on the menu this week. All we have is the blue plate special and the blue page this plate special is you're not entitled to, to feel motivated on something that you've been procrastinating on but i can help you get started if you'd be willing to spend five minutes on the thing you're procrastinating on we'll make a little uh, what's the first thing you'd have to do i'd have to sit down in my chair and number two i'd have to turn on the computer and three i'd have to go to whatever it is I'm, I'm avoiding and four, I'd ha have to do this and five, I've had to do this, just little things that they can do in 15 seconds. And then I say, uh, would you be willing to do this even though you're not in the mood and what time would you be willing to do it? And so they give me a time like six o'clock tonight, I'll, I'll agree to work for five minutes. And then I say at the end of the five minutes, would you be willing to call me and leave a message either mission accomplished or I stubbornly refused. And that's that's how I do it. And the idea is that if you get started, then you once you get into the task, then you'll start to feel mo motivated. But you've got to get started and waiting for motivation, you'll be you'll be waiting forever. And I use this all, all the time in my in my own life. I just finished my tax preparation for this year. You know, I had to do my expenses for, for the year and some things I sold that I made a profit on and get all, all that done. And it's incredibly anxiety provoking 
for me. I don't, I love busy work because I'm not very bright. So if you give me a busy work, I'll be happy as can be. But when I have to figure stuff out and I can't remember where those records are on my computer, it's very anxiety provoking. And so I just give myself, just get started on this thing. Just spend, agree to work on it for one minute. I, I just give myself the one minute rule. I suddenly find that I can do the first step or two. And then as I get into it, I start to feel motivated and, it, and it's kind of fun. So that idea that action comes first, motivation comes second has been incredibly, incredibly helpful for, for me. And if I didn't follow that rule, my life would be one huge procrastination because I'm like anybody. I get, get anxious when I have to do hard, difficult things. I feel insecure. I have a lot of distorted thoughts that seem seem real and then once I dive into the task I say wow th this task is, is kind of fun this is not you know really really hard and really terrible I know Greg has uh he's actually studied like really successful founders and, and entrepreneurs and, and people in life and uh I wonder if that ties into like how these successful founders have created these like huge successful uh corporations just thinking about like where they start like action precedes motivation is it the motivation that comes first yeah. from the founder or is it the or is it the action part? i don't know you'd have to you'd have to ask them i don't comment on things i don't have any data about i i, I just know that when people who are in business i admire fantastically because I, I have the gift of healing people and teaching people how to how to heal people, but I don't have the the gift of knowing how companies work or ad, administering things. If if I had to do that, I I I would be very unsuccessful, I'm afraid. But people who are in in business, they have a fantastic skill set that that I don't necessarily have. Um, but it'd be interesting to to find find out. I, probably a lot of the ways that people get into business, though, particularly if you're starting a business, is a vision that they have. That's something they're excited about and passionate about, and they may be spurred on by, you know, positive uh, fantasies and ideas about the great things that that can be happening. I I've been pretty disappointed, for example, with the quality of psychotherapy. I've I've over 50,000 mental health professionals have attended training programs I've done around the United States and Canada in the last 25 or 30 years. But I've been disappointed that it's so hard for them to learn the new techniques we've developed because they're so different from the way most mental health professionals uh, feel. Uh, they're, they're trained in things that really, really don't don't work. And so I, I've been working with some younger colleagues. For 40 years, I've wanted to develop an app. I've always felt I could develop an electronic version of my, myself and, and my, my, that would be more effective even than my first book, Feeling Good. And finally, just recently, some young colleagues came to me and said, we'd like to help you to create that app. So I have about three, three or four really brilliant folks working with me. And our, our dream, my dream is to develop an inexpensive tool or one that people could use for free if they didn't have any money that would outperform a human therapist. And I think our early beta testing indicates we're probably going to be able to, to, to do that. And, and I know for us, it's the positive vision that spurs us on, as well as when we come to a problem, every day we come to some impossible problem that can't be solved. It's going to doom us. And then we brainstorm, and all of a sudden we get a solution to it. And that is such an exciting, exciting process. And I think for a lot of businesses, it's that type of positive thinking that, that may, may create may create motivation. I think procrastination more has to do with tasks that, that are unpleasant to us and that we're afraid of and anxiety provoking and make us feel kind of uh, re really, really insecure. As you were describing uh, your experience with taxes, I, I could empathize with you. I, I feel that too. I have a hard time with it. Um, and, and it and I like you a lot more right now. I'm so <laughs> happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and then your solution of, okay, just work on it for one minute and, and sit down at the desk and, you know, open your computer and open your notebook and, and, and like kind of break it down into the small micro tasks uh, yep. 
in order to get it accomplished um, and, and just commit yourself that you'll do those like mechanical micro tasks. And then, uh, and, and if you could do that, at least then you're successful and that you could actually just step away. Um, so, so you get that kind of feeling of victory. Um, but, but then, you know, as you said, you, as you find, like, once you've kind of broken through that threshold and gotten started, you have kind of a momentum and, and you find yourself in, in actually enjoying it in some ways. Um, and, and actually that reminded me of uh, BJ Fogg's recent book uh, called Tiny Habits. Um, he's a professor at Stanford too. Um, but he talks about, you know, this question of what drives someone to do a behavior. And he has this theory of map where it's a combination of motivation, ability, and prompt. And so by, by just committing to, you'll, you'll sit down for one minute to concentrate on it. It makes the ability, uh, threshold, uh, much easier. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so, so that, that has a way of, um, kind of getting people started. Cool. Awesome. Another, um, interesting thing I wanted to bring up that I, that might be interesting to just think through and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, David, is like, just going back to founders. A lot of founders, uh, this is a study from Michael Friedman. He had a 50, uh, 50% of entrepreneurs are more, like, more likely to have mental health conditions. And here are some of them. So he talks about founders having two times more depression, six times more likely to have ADHD, three times more likely to have substance abuse, 10 times more likely to have bipolar disorder, two times more to have uh, psychiatric hospitalization two times more suicide thoughts. Why? I guess, I guess what would you do for founders? I mean, me and me and Greg are founders. And I'm just curious, like in the world of founders and the pressure, like there's some, you know, some horrible stories that have just happened. Like, uh, I'll give you two. Tony Shea, the founder of Zappos, really big shoe company. He passed away recently, supposedly from mental health issues. And then uh, mm, Kate, sad. Kate, yeah. And, and another example is Kate Spade, the fashion designer also passed away. So these are people that are like kind of successful. <laughs> They've kind of like done yeah. amazing things yet that didn't resolve whatever was happening for them. I'm just curious, like your thoughts on like those types of people and those types of founders, like what type of treatments would you, uh, I guess, I guess it is dependent on the person, but like just your gut reaction, just hearing this, like, what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, the, uh, first of all, the uh, suicide is a horrible thing and it, it hits people regardless of, of success or, or status or stature. A very prominent uh, mental health professional who, who was a uh, really high level leader and a very beloved person recently committed suicide and was a, it's all, always comes at a, a tremendous shock to people because you you can't you can't tell really if someone is suicidal or how someone is is feeling without asking or without getting the data so when when I do therapy with people I I measure their feelings at the beginning and end of every therapy session they do it before and after the session so it doesn't take any time, but I find out how depressed are you at this moment? How suicidal are you at this moment? How anxious? How angry? How happy? And how do how you feel about your partnership or your marriage or, you know, your your loved one? How satisfied or un- dissatisfied are you? And at the end of the session, they, they do that again. So I have the data right, right away when someone is or when they're getting suicidal so you can, you can intervene. But a lot of uh, a lot of de- suicidal thinking comes from h- hopelessness, as as well as self self critical thoughts, think, thinking that that you're not good enough, and and the belief that you'll that you'll never get better, that you'll you'll never recover. And about two thirds, at least, of depressed patients, including people listening to this podcast right now, who are feeling down, feeling they're not good enough, you get this illusion. It's a delusion, but it's the belief that things will never change for for me. The truth is out about me. I really am worthless. And any time I was happy, I was feeling myself, and and I'm going to be feeling like this forever. And then when people are feeling hopeless, they turn to suicide as the only escape from their incredible internal pain. And the pain of uh, loss of self-esteem and hopelessness is some of the worst suffering. And when you add anxiety to it, it's just really intense, intense thing. And it's it's sad because 100% of the time if people will stick with effective treatment, they, they will recover. Your thoughts and feelings can't not 
change. They're, they're always changing. But when you're hopeless, you get the idea you're frozen into some hell that, that will never will never change. I've treated so many people who felt suicidal and and hopeless and you know they're not all famous people i've had a number who were you know incredibly wealthy and at my hospital in philadelphia we we created a a, a big cognitive therapy group program for the people and around our hospital it was an inner city hospital and we treated you know homeless people and people who couldn't read or write who had the same same kinds of feelings, and surprisingly, that population was one of the easiest to work with uh, that I that that I've ever had. Although I find now all depressed people pretty easy to work with because of the new techniques we've been developing in the last ten or fifteen years at in my Stanford training group.